Thank you. Please take your seat so that we can start. Thank you and welcome to this uh, session of the uh, 2018 Best Practice Forum on Local Content. Um, briefly introducing myself, I'm Wim Degeselle. I'm working uh, with the uh, IGF Secretariat and um, working as a consultant supporting uh, this year's uh, Best Practice Forum on Local Content. Um, a best practice forum is basically one of the forms or one of the activities the IGF, the IGF is having in between sessions. Um, so it's not limited to just this uh, one workshop at the meeting itself. It starts before, it starts in, it works in between uh, the two IGF meetings. And uh, the idea is to bring uh, people, stakeholders, specialists, uh, together around one specific topic uh, and have them exchange, uh, collect best practices and document that into a document that then later can be used as an inspiration um, basically for everyone that, um, that could make use, for it, use from it, um, also as an inspiration for the uh, policy debate or policy debates on the, uh, on the topic. Uh, as you um, might have seen, this is the second year there is a best practice forum on um, uh, local content. Uh, last year um, there was a BPF local content more focusing on the uh, initial question. Uh, what is local content and why is it, is imp why is it important? Uh, that um, BPF also collected some examples but more uh, examples of initiatives that are focused on the creation of local content without uh, asking specific questions on um, who are the organizations behind or who is doing it. Just focusing on the question, why is local content important and what examples uh, can be found. This year, um, there was a proposal, uh, I think supported by your two uh, MAC coordinators and they sit here, Nacho and Giacomo, they sit in the, uh, in the room. Uh, there was a proposal to uh, dive a little bit deeper and go and look um, for existing models and make the step to, from the, um, the existing project, make the step to more the economical model behind and whether there is uh, a value chain that can be um, uh, can be identified and whether it's possible to uh, move from local content initiatives to local content initiatives that are sustainable and that can be uh, uh, further developed in, in the longer term. Uh, so that brings us to the session today. Uh, I think throughout our work and our discussions we have identified different elements, angles. Um, one is the um, uh, the idea of, okay, this is the internet and there are probably completely new models and completely new things um, that, have been, uh, that have been developed and that are worth sharing. Uh, there might also, a second point, be uh, elements that can help the, uh, the producers of, uh, of local content, uh, that can help them in the way, elements that can create an enabling environment that can support them or uh, put it in another way uh, try to less hinder them in, uh, in creating content. Uh, and the third um, angle we also looked at were uh, other specific policy initiatives or other initiatives that really support um, the, uh, the creators of, of local content. Uh, but I would like to keep it there um, as an introduction on what the BPF is, what the BPF is the BPF is doing. You might have seen that we have a draft document out uh, on the web, on the IGF website. Uh, the idea is that that document uh, will also include and reflect the discussions and the experiences shared during this, uh, this session. 
and then will be published as an output document after uh, after the meeting. Uh, so if you have time, also go. Please take uh, take your time, have a look there, and if you have suggestions uh, of ide uh, ideas that can uh, be included in the document, uh, please do so. Uh, but then I would like to move um, to our discussion, uh, our main discussion today, uh, the exchange of experiences. We have, I think, a great panel um, of people that, that do a lot of great work uh, in different different ways, different parts of the world. Uh, the panel will be uh, led by Bertrand uh, Mouillet. I will let you introduce yourself. That will be probably the easiest. And as you will see, we will hear a lot of uh, great stories. And I hope that um, you take something from it, but uh, we're also counting on, uh, on the room um, to bring in your experiences and um, and share that with us. So thank you, and Bertrand, please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Wim. Um, I think I'll spare you uh, my introduction. I'm a, I'm a consultant. I work uh, with trade associations in the audiovisual content uh, sectors across the world. And uh, it's a, an honor and a privilege to be in involved in the IGF process for the, the fourth year running. Uh, it's also very encouraging to see that IGF has expanded its coverage of um, discussions on local content. Yesterday we had uh, a local content uh, forum uh, with WIPO and, and EDU amongst others. And uh, there will also be a session tomorrow morning at 10 past 10 on uh, local content in the intersection with the issues of underserved regions. So do watch this space uh, and as Vim said, do contribute to, to the process. Um, we have a jumbo panel this afternoon, as you can see, and actually some of it is actually hidden. We have a, a remote participant, and we're aware that we're also short of time, and that this has to be a participatory process. So bear with us. We're going to try and give you very clipped and dynamic little introductory uh, uh, moments from each of the speakers. We'll spare the introductions about their long and distinguished uh, careers. They'll go straight to, to the, the core topics. Uh, but uh, the context, I think, is interesting, uh, again, because we had um, uh, <coughs> a keynote speech from President Macron yesterday, which, uncharacteristically, perhaps, uh, relative to the IGF history, did take care to put the emphasis on the preservation of creativity uh, and as in, in connection to the economic development of the Internet and even talked about the reinforcement uh, and the primacy of content of a network, controversially or not, I do not know. But uh, again, this shows that local content has indeed uh, acquired pride of place in this, in this important forum. Um, so I will start, uh, we will start this short introduction with uh, Roberto Gaetano of ALAC in Italy. Uh, Roberto is a, is a very experienced I, I can. Uh, uh, participant and insider is also the founder of uh, individual user, the Individual Users Association. I think with you, we want to hear about aspects of the underwiring, the technology issues, because as they relate to the empowerment of, of local content, especially in, in minority language regions. Yes. Thank you, Bertrand. <coughs> yes, I, I um, will um, keep it short because we have a, a lot of interesting examples of uh, real contents uh, to show you. Um, and, and I would like uh, just to spend a few words to um, explain what could be uh, an issue, what could be a problem uh, uh, that is related uh, to, uh, that will hinder the uh, development of um, uh, local contents. Um, in uh, um, in the early days uh, of the internet, uh, uh, domain names uh, were uh, basically um, only in, uh, in ASCII, that is uh, the, the English uh, script, the English alphabet. Um, top level domain um, were short, uh, two or three letters, uh, uh, like two letters for the country codes and three letters for the Gener generic uh, like uh, .com, .org, uh, and so on. And then at a certain point in time, uh, this was um, um, changed. Uh, and new domain names were introduced, uh, some of which also in different uh, scripts. Uh, 
I was uh, actually on the ICANN board when uh, the decision was made and those uh, IDNs, uh, which is, stands for Internationalized Domain Names, um, was introduced. Uh, and the idea was that that uh, uh, would have helped uh, the development uh, of local websites uh, um, using local names uh, in, the, in the local languages and using that uh, um, uh, local scripts. So we have um, introduced uh, um, domain names uh, that were in Arabic, in Chinese, uh, in uh, Georgian, uh, Cyrillic, and so on. Um, the problem is uh, that a lot of the application that are part of the current, uh, even now in 2018, are part uh, of uh, the internet infrastructure don't fully support uh, these uh, names, uh, even years uh, after their uh, introduction. And uh, um, in, for this, uh, there are uh, groups that are working, and especially the uh, Universal Acceptance Working Group. But um, I don't want to uh, you know, get into details, and then if somebody is interested, we can have a chat um, uh, outside uh, uh, after the after the session. Um, I, I uh, wanted only to raise this uh, um, because uh, in my opinion it is, uh, um, it, it is a potential limitation for um, the access uh, uh, to the internet uh, uh, by uh, users who don't uh, speak English and are unable to read uh, the English alphabet. Uh, um, but I have also um, a question, um, basically, to the uh, to the next um, um, presenters, uh, or whether they uh, believe that this uh, this limitation is uh, something that is really hindering uh, um, the the development of, of local contents uh, or not. In, as a matter of fact, you can have local contents on a website that has uh, a name uh, in. Um, in English, uh, with the English alphabet. Uh, in my opinion, that will make it a little bit more difficult for local people to um, uh, access that content. Uh, but I would like um, you know, to hear whether, whether this is just uh, the view of uh, a techie or whether this is a real problem. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Roberto. And perhaps to go uh, a little deeper into that dimension, we're lucky to have <laughs> our um, a colleague, Ucha Seturi, who's just joined us. I think you, you, as you can see, the roster is very full. You're welcome to come up if, if you're happy to speak from your seat. Uh, this is an informal process. You've been uh, involved in the Telecom Operators Association of Georgia, and you're a coordinator of, of the Tusheti Project, which is a remote region of Georgia. How much do you resonate with uh, the remarks that uh, Roberto has made on the necessity to, um, uh, to universalize uh, scripts so that the uh, access can be uh, secured for minority languages in particular in regions, and that you can then use the infrastructure to, to make local content but also make it reach out? Okay. Um, excuse me for being late. Uh, it's very crucial. Uh, it's really very crucial because uh, connection is a just technical layer. It's a very remote area of my country, and yes, area without any connection. So right now they have connection. But uh, most important part is uh, rising awareness and uh, help them. Uh, to have some e-skills for producing local content because without this, uh, this is just internet without some uh, uh, real points and real meaning for them. That's why uh, we had some uh, trainings, we did some trainings uh, for the local community members uh, for e-skills and uh, for uh, creating some uh, uh, local content, local pages to sell the uh, local products. Um, and also I have to speak about very briefly about Georgian script because the script is very unique. One is uh, from world famous 14 scripts. So 
it's very crucial. And society, Georgian speaking society, is very small. So this project was very important for them. I mean, the trainings uh, for the local community members for creating their e-commerce uh, space, e-commerce pages, and, uh, and content on the local language for local society, but not only. But they are also creating uh, 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 content on Georgian, on English, and also Russian, because Georgia is a post-Soviet country, and we have Russian-speaking society also. And also tourists there from uh, post-Soviet areas. Well, thank you for this, and uh, I hope there'll be other opportunities for you to uh, to pitch in. As I said, we're trying to, uh, and thank you for respecting that format, trying to create the initial introductions quite short and, and crisp. I'd like to uh, to turn now to the audiovisual uh, creators and uh, producers participants, and maybe starting with uh, you, Eni uh, Omerwa. You were once a, a, a chartered accountant, uh, a safe professional prospect, and then you decided recklessly to throw it all away to become a, a producer of music and, and increasingly film content in your country, Nigeria. And I think it'd be interesting to see how you see um, your activities uh, creating a, a stable prospect for you and your colleagues, as in building a sector that is self-sustainable, and what strategies you're deploying uh, to that effect. Once again, thank you for having me. Um, so, not a chartered accountant, but just a regular accountant. <laughs> Maybe that made it easier to leave. Um, <clears throat> but I do, I have always sort of believed in um, the ability for content to sort of shape the way people are seen and who they are and what they say about themselves. And with technology enabling us in um, my space to be able to tell our own stories, and I always remark that what is known as the Nollywood um, film space, which is a Nigerian version of the word Hollywood, um, was men who, and women who built themselves up by their own, own bootstraps, building stories or telling stories out of nothing and just sort of pushing their, their, the, the African sensibility through these stories. Um, but now there is a revolution and f I think people like me who see who also have a big picture in mind and see the power of um, this thing as a cultural, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, it sort of, the temperature, you can tell sort of the cultural temperature and the fact that now we live in a world where we can spread these messages out and spread these, um, the, the narrative out about who we are, who we say we are, who we want to be, and it's now our time to own the narrative. Um, I think every every space has its narrative, every space has its brand, but to sort of lift our voices up among the pantheon of voices to, to own and tell the world who we are as opposed to what everybody else, uh, everybody else thinks we are. Thank you. Well, I, give, uh, I think we'll hopefully return to you with uh, maybe a case study. You had an interesting uh, film recently, uh, Calling God, yeah. which you, you might talk about later no on. Problem. Um, Emma, you're also Emma Desio. You're also uh, uh, you're in this, live in the same city as as Annie. In fact, um, it's thanks to Annie that I heard about your first film, uh, which is going to be screened tonight uh, as part of our evening on local content at 7:30 in in the restaurant upstairs. If you have an RSVP, please feel free to do so and come to us about details. But um, would you like to tell us how you uh, made the decision to actually take the the considerable risk of putting together your first feature and what sort of opportunities and, and, and obstacles you encountered at local level? Um, I, I, my, my first film is called Kasala and it's a story about the about four boys who live in one of the who lives in one of who live in the slums in, in one of the biggest slums in Lagos. Um, I decided to make this film because I'd worked as a video journalist for the BBC and I would go into these communities and speak to people from there and they had a sense of pride with them, within, with the environment unlike the narrative that we see of people from these areas or saying that they are destitute. Yes, they have problems but they have sort of built a coping mechanism around them to cope with the issues or issues facing them and they had a sense of community and I was very inspired by my um, by my interactions with them and I wanted to make this film um, it was one of the hardest things to have done as a filmmaker because there's no sort of funding for 
independent filmmakers in Nigeria, and then there's a certain type of narrative being put out there in Nollywood where everybody has to come from, um, from, from wealthy homes, from, ex from wealthy backgrounds, and people from these communities didn't have their stories told. So I went to friends and families, I threatened my sisters, <laughs> raised enough money and I went into the community and used the skills that I had built over time to produce, to direct, to shoot and edit the film because I was really passionate and I wanted to see this film come to life. Um, initially, we have less than 157 screens in Nigeria and there's a fight for this content to come in to, to, to go to the cinemas and my film was refused in Nigeria um, because they said it was too arty and it wasn't for the target audience and it didn't fit the Nollywood narrative but I put it out in film festivals and it's been traveling to about 24 different film festivals. And there's a huge demand for content like this because the Nigerian audience want to see themselves on the screen. And you know, we've sort of built an ecosystem where even though the film was made with a budget of about $10,000, we have, yes, <laughs> we have, it, it's like an ecosystem of young people earning a living from this sort of film, from making films and, you know, telling their story. So it's a fight within, within Nollywood to create and to put work out there. Thank you, but I'm sure we'll have opportunities to come, come back, to get back to you uh, with questions later on. I'd like to move to Jean-Hubert Nancam. He's the Francophone on our panel today. Uh, so he'll be speaking French and I'll be trying my, doing my best to run a, a, a running translation. Forgive my... Forgive my stammering. Uh, Jean-Hubert, you've been involved for a long time as a television producer in Ivory Coast, uh, making a programming that's focused on the young, really, on not uh, telling the young or how they ought to be, but really working with the youth, uh, trying to harvest their impressions about their place in the world and reflect this in your, uh, in your very successful uh, series, which is now on its third season, uh, Teenagers, and also around this, create uh, this uh, web community, this, this uh, social media presence in which the young can further interact into your process. So it'd be very interesting to hear you describe this in a few words. Okay, merci. Uh, je suis, suis producteur de contenu uh, audiovisuel depuis uh, 27 ans. I'm a producer of uh, 27 je years en France of audiovisual content. I started in France. Ensuite, je suis en Afrique, en Côte d'Ivoire, qui n'est pas mon pays. Je suis Camerounais d'origine, mais j'y suis comme chez moi. I'm from Cameroon, but I feel at home in Ivory Coast. Alors, j'ai été producteur de, de flux, c'est-à-dire des missions de débat, des I documentaires. I produce uh, et documentaries and reality pour TV5. shows. Pour TV5. Pendant, pendant plusieurs années. TV5 et, et il y a 12 ans, je me suis intéressé au contenu série télé parce que je voyais bien que les télé novelas envahissaient nos écrans. Et nous avons produit une première série qui s'appelle Classe A, qui a été diffusée sur A, 15 pays en Afrique francophone avec beaucoup de succès. C'était la cible 18-25 ans qui nous intéressait donc à ça. Et quand on a fait le tour de sept pays francophones pour tenter de produire une saison 2, when we try to produce a second season going around the francophone countries je me suis rendu compte que la cible qui uh, qui était la plus engagée sur ce programme des 18 25 ans était en fait une cible d'adolescents qui I était autour de 10 à 17 ans the engaged target group was uh, more the teenage uh, sub demographic donc il m'a semblé plus intelligent dans ma démarche de producteur d'aller vers cette cible qui uh, qui me suivait totalement so parce more, que more appropriate for me to focus on that particular target group that was following basically the, the cible. Oui, justement parce que c'était la série de leur aîné immédiat. Because it was the series watched by their, their, uh, elder, their, their older brothers. Voilà, donc euh, le premier so modèle d'un adolescent, c'est son grand frère qui est déjà jeune adulte. So the, the, the older brother, older sister, that's who's already a, a, a young adult. Voilà, donc le choix de produire la série Teenager avait pour motivation de leur projeter à travers l'écran leur monde. So we wanted to project back at them uh, the image of their own world. Donc nous avons commencé dans une saison une avec des jeunes de 10 à 15 ans. We started with a young uh, one to 15 years old. Qui, uh, sorry, 10 to 15 years voilà, old. qui était bien sûr engagé dans la formation scolaire. Hein. Were at school, of school age and at school. Dans la série n'était pas une alternative à l'école. 
mais plutôt l'occasion de leur donner la possibilité de porter leur parole et d'exprimer de, ce qu'ils ressentent en tant qu'adolescents. Alors nous sommes aujourd'hui à la saison 4, et c'est une expérience de plus de 10 ans. Voilà, donc pendant ces 10 ans, je me suis rendu compte que ce public avait quelque chose à dire et que la société dans laquelle ils vivaient n'était pas forcément celle dans laquelle ils se sentaient le plus épanouis. Nous avons fait en tout à peu près 300 focus groups sur les 10 ans avec à chaque fois 50 jeunes et le scénario de chaque saison et le scénario de chaque saison et en fait, la contribution de ces jeunes suit des histoires qu'ils veulent voir à l'écran pour se remettre en question. Donc, je suis revenu sur la cible 18-25 ans avec les mêmes jeunes qui ont grandi. Nous avons une communauté de 120 000 jeunes qui nous suivent. Voilà. Et à partir de cette communauté, nous avons lancé il y a deux ans euh, l'idée de les consulter. And we've launched the idea of consulting that community par un concept qui s'appelle Appel à texte. L'idée, c'est qu'un jeune, à travers un thème, qui peut être la famille, l'argent, le travail. Écrivent un texte write a text. dans lequel il donne son état d'esprit par rapport mind, à la société actuelle, in, in to the mais society. surtout à la fin de ce texte qu'il exprime le monde dans lequel il a envie de vivre. And crucially that he or she expresses what kind of world they want to live in going forward. Alors le thème est choisi par rapport à son vécu, sa sensibilité. Et de toute façon, dans ce texte, on saura ce que ce jeune attend. Je vais conclure. L'objectif, c'est sur plusieurs pays so euh, d'arriver à faire écrire 1000 textes par 1000 jeunes de chaque pays. Et nous sommes convaincus qu'à la fin de cette démarche, on aura l'attente des jeunes dans chacun de ces pays. Et ça pourrait être un support pour que les décideurs affinent leur politique. Sachant qu'ils seront prêts à contribuer pour ce nouveau monde le leur. Alors, le rapport avec le digital, c'est que c'est à travers le digital que nous développons cet aspect de notre série Nous sommes convaincus qu'on peut créer un modèle économique qui pourra changer les comportements de ces 120 000 jeunes. Pour moi, producteur, une série, ça sert à ça. Ça ne sert pas seulement à écrire une histoire. Et le digital devient pour moi un partenaire en termes de choix, d'option, d'expression. J'ai besoin intellectuellement de personnes qui accepteront de participer à ce développement. Je suis convaincu qu'il y a une matière énorme et je suis conscient que je ne peux pas le porter tout seul. Donc je vous attends. Merci. Merci beaucoup Jean-Hubert. Et encore, je suis sûr qu'il y aura des questions et retourner. Je vais tourner maintenant à Alain Modo, qui, même si le francophone a souhaité qu'il allait avoir un go en anglais. Thank you, Alain. Um, the, uh, for sparing me. The, um, Alain is a consultant and also a sales agent in the um, film and television space. Uh, he has a sales agency that specializes in African content. But he's here uh, in lieu of the, president, act, the current president of the African Broadcasting Union to, on his behalf, explain the 
bare bones of a project of an alliance between public broadcasters in Africa to develop uh, content strategically together. Three minutes. Thank you, Bertrand. I hope my English do not need your presence and your participation. Yes, I'm just uh, talking about, um, I'm just talking uh, on behalf of uh, Grigor Njeka from uh, AUB and from all the partners who have been working on this uh, project. In fact, since I'm working in Africa since uh, five years, six years, I understand. I understood that the market is very difficult, not only for producers, as it was explained, but also for public broadcasters and new broadcasters. The market is uh, with low money, the market with all the funds are in dispersion, and it is very difficult to create and to support uh, African content. So the idea is to, to see what is possible to do uh, together with broad public broadcasters, independent producers, and uh, experts in order to to raise a sort of virtuous mechanism which will give the opportunity for the public broadcaster to get premium content and for independent producers to, to be funded for their, for their project. Uh, this, this idea of this hub uh, came from the fact that today in Africa there are only uh, most of the time uh, telenovelas on the public channels and I'm sure that many African viewers really want to, to see something different. And the second thing, most important, that the lion's share of the good African content is taken by Pan-African broadcasters, Canal Plus, uh, Chinese of Star Time, uh, and uh, TV5 uh, for the Francophone countries. And the idea is to give to the local channel, to the national public channel, even sometimes with uh, commercial channels, the, pos the possibility to reach this content, to reach this premium content, and to have it on a premium window in order to give good content to the audience, in order also to, to recoup some money from the advertising market. So the idea uh, we are working on since two years is to create this kind of syndication, uh, regroupment, this hub, where all the African uh, members of the African Union of Broadcasters will work together. They will bring their resources, even poor, all together to choose what kind of programs they want to buy or what kind of programs they want to finance. And when they come together, the big advantage of this solution is that it does not cost more for each of them because it brings the same amount of money. All together, they can have a reasonable amount of money. But finally, what is interesting is that they bring their territories where the public channels are broadcasting over 100% of the territory. And this is very interesting for two kinds of uh, partners. First, the advertising, who, are, who is always looking for a wider um, footprint for their, uh, for their advertising campaign, but also for public funds like uh, foundation. I think about uh, the Bill Gates Foundation when, when they are doing a campaign to, for them to raise awareness on uh, public health. They really need to reach the, to, to reach the people they, they want to, to talk, and sometimes the best possibility is to reach the, these people with the public, uh, public television. So this hub will be not only um, a possibility for the public television in Africa to get fresh content, high quality content, to, to broadcast it in premium uh, window, but it will be also an opportunity for the uh, pr independent producer to bring diversity, to bring quality, quality and to be funded by this uh, mechanism. And it is also, finally, the possibility to uh, some partners like uh, European Union, like the Agence France Development, like Bill Gates Foundation, like uh, uh, Nestlé or Castel, who are the big uh, uh, advertisers in Africa, to reach a huge number of people on a huge number of countries. So this syndication uh, will be also the possibility to be more transparent and more well managed for the investment and transparency, quality and diversity will be the major, uh, major goals to reach uh, together between broadcasters uh, and uh, independent producers. Thank you, Alain. Um, uh, we have uh, Annie Dalakin waiting to speak to us from Yerevan about the, the very important aspect of con uh, the local content issue, which is education. Before we do that, logically, I'd like to f 
maybe wrap up this uh, subsection on the audiovisual professional content with you, uh, Gonzalo Laguado Serpa. You, uh, you are involved with Pro Imágenes, which is the uh, film agency, um, strategic film agency in Colombia. Your industry has gone from, I think, four films a year less than 10 years ago to 44, 45, yeah, last year. Can you explain what was the need to create, uh, to c how you went about creating this, uh, this transformation and also why it was needed uh, for the public sector to intervene in order to make a viable, sustainable uh, sector emerge? Well, thank you. Um, we created several systems uh, that have boosted local production. I'm going to, time is short, so I will save you the details on how they work. But they were needed especially because there was no money to produce content. And this is something that Cristina Gallego in earlier ses sessions of the Best Practice Forum, the IGF, has mentioned. And she jokingly mentioned that what producers needed most was money. And to some extent she was correct, because we have created autonomous sources of financing that in turn have created what you have just mentioned, which is a, an exponential rise in the number of local films that are produced yearly. Um, but I will spare you the details on how it works. Um, we still, I mean, we have boost, we have tackled production and we have tackled access to production to a degree, but we have some other challenges that we still need to face, and that is the delivery of that content. Because we have found that, and Cristina Gallego mentioned this as well, local content doesn't travel very well, at least in my region. And it not only does it not travel very well, but it doesn't have a very long lifespan, li lifespan in our country. So uh, the theatrical uh, span in which movies exist in Colombia are very short, and I'm speaking about local content exclusively. And so we need to find several different ways to go to market, um, either by digital means or by alternative um, circuits of distribution, such as museums and whatnot. We are trying to devise new ways to, to make it easier for films to stay in relevance for more time. Thank you, Thank you for that um, uh, panorama. I know it's quite difficult to ask you to set the Set the, set the picture in, in, uh, in very little time, but again, we can come back. And uh, we'll close this first kind of round up, as it were, with uh, Annie Dalakin, who is, uh, I think, connected now. She's in Yerevan, in Armenia. Yeah. She's, not, she's not with us. I think she has a colleague in the room who also has some knowledge of... Um, of the projects that we'll be discussing? No? No connection at this point? D'accord. Would you like to, to perhaps speak, or, or perhaps introduce yourself? I'm sorry yes. we haven't had a chance to speak, but to discuss the, the interesting projects which have to do with uh, local libraries, rural libraries, and education in, in Armenia, and especially, I think, rural Armenia. Yes, thank you, Bertrand. Uh, my name is Liana Galstam. I'm from the Armenian IGF. It's very unfortunate that our youth participant, Dani Delakian, could not connect remotely. This is one of the technical challenges that we have. Um, she is the graduate of the Armenian School on Internet Governance, and what she prepared and what we had a discussion was the uh, at the IGF, the national IGF that we had quite recently on uh, 10th of October. Uh, it's the online educational platforms that we have in Armenia. And we touched upon three aspects. And uh, should I talk about that now or it will be on a later discussion, Bertrand? Perhaps briefly, if you could headline what sort yeah, of initiatives yeah, okay. we're talking about and then feel free later okay. on to pitch in, yes. Thank you. So one of them is the virtual uh, college uh, the, that we have on uh, topics and the courses that, uh, in Armenian. Uh, and the second one is the rural libraries and uh, in general the 
situation in libraries and uh, uh, digitalization of all materials in libraries that we have. And the third uh, project is the, um, the two more creative technologies, Center for Creative Technologies and all the courses that we have there. So all these materials are available online and uh, we'll talk about this uh, project. Thank you. So much. Well, we are where I hope we would be, uh, given the small time budget, 90 minutes is nothing, given the vastness of the issues. As you can see, I think the, the, the very extended panel we have attests to the, the fact that uh, local content is a portmanteau uh, co <laughs> concept uh, to which a lot of different uh, ish areas of issues attach. I think one of them we've seen is and Vim was very good at pointing this out in his um, very cogent introduction, is sustainability, which can mean all sorts of things. It can be cultural and economic. And I think that might be one area of focus. I was suddenly tempted to, to ask you, Ucha, in terms of what you've done in, in this uh, sub-region of Georgia, uh, whether there are examples of, of concrete you know, local content creation, rather uh, either tangible products like agricultural products, that reach the e-commerce infrastructure through your efforts or, or cultural products that are relevant uh, to people uh, living in the Tushati uh, region, for instance? Uh, well, thanks for this question. Uh, it's an interesting part because all community networks need some sust sustainable uh, business model because without it, it's just network without some uh, support. Uh, so, uh, for local communities, this was opportunity because uh, they are selling local products online. And uh, how explain? Uh, for example, very special uh, Georgian sheep cheese is just from this region. So, for Georgians, it's very special uh, opportunity to buy because this region, until all this project was without any connection. So, right now, they have plans they get, so it's working inside. I'm talking about also another biological clean product. So this region is without any some uh, influence, uh, without any cars, etc. So the products are in very high demand. So that's why that's why it's working. Uh, and another point is also related to the e-commerce because uh, it's very touristic uh, area. So that's why all small houses right now are hostels. So they are in hospitality business. So uh, in this direction also, internal or in book economy somewhere else, they also create content for selling uh, their services, I mean hospitality services. That's why uh, it's working in a few directions. And uh, I checked uh, data just uh, one month ago. The uh, amount of the um, traffic is also increasing and increasing. It's 10 times ten time more than was uh, six months ago. So it's working, it's uh, business, models, business model is also sustainable, so maybe it will be interesting for someone. Thanks. I never thought that I'd find myself making the connection but from cheese farmers to film producers. I think um, to make a, a, a more than a, a a joke. Uh, there are, I mean, the issue of sustainability is one that you've, you're encountering all the time in your industry. Um, I'm thinking of you, Annie, uh, and, and Emma. Emma, you mentioned, you know, giving, creating, giving job opportunities. Uh, you were working with a skeleton crew on Kasala, but these are people who got job experience and maybe have prospects of going on to work in the rest of the industry. How do you see, and perhaps maybe through an example, any that you may have of a recent film you were involved with, how do you see making your content sustainable so that what you have to spend to make it is actually matched by what the demand out there is prepared to pay for it? We've been, we've been dealing a lot with just sort of rethinking the process. So um, how do we do things to fit our specific environment um, in, in this case specifically, we're working on a, a faith-based film. The name is called God Calling. And going out to raise for this film, because a lot of what I do is film financing, and which is more or less threatening um, friends and family <laughs> and brothers and sisters and uncles and from, to raise money to make 
a film, and in this case, it, it was a little, I wouldn't use the word easier, it was different because you were appealing to people's sort of heart and religion and all of those different kinds of things to try to tell a specific story. But what we wanted to do was, in order to make sure we're able to pay this money back, is we've not, we, we sat with a, produ with a distributor who is going to let us release in theaters, at the same time re do um, literal go out to churches and and pr distribute through church church halls, and and at the same time also release day and date digitally. Um, okay, can you explain day and date? That sounds like industry jargon. So, so day, and <laughs> I'm not sure I understand it myself. But um, day and date is m when you're able to bring a film out across your multiple sort of streams, theater, um, physical release with us with distribution and digitally all at the same time. Um, a lot the way the industry has normally worked in Hollywood or in, in the outside world is there are windows. So you might do a theatrical release first, then you can do um, a streaming release later, then maybe go on to do your other the other end of your tail. Um, but for us, it's been like you know what we need to make this money back. We live in an environment where there are only under 50 cinemas. Um, on over 100 million people, how do you get this thing out to them? How do you avoid being plagiarized and um, um, copied and sold on the street? You know, there are many examples of people, your film is in the cinema and someone has sort of made a copy and it's on a DVD selling in, in, on the street. Um, so how do you give this thing to people at the same time trying to maximize the investment? So we needed to rethink the model in pulling things out and it's been interesting we were shocked when the when the distributor agreed to do this i think they understood where we were coming from and we think now we can probably pipe um this certain kind of genre specific project in this model because you it's built for specific audience so you can take it to them and emma is there something you wanted to add to this i, I think that nollywood um that's a nigerian um, film in film and television industry has learned to take the bull by the horn. Um, I mean, we come from the home video background where we started making films out of home video cameras, and um, it, 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 you know the, the beautiful thing about Nollywood is that even in that time, in that era of home videos. The, the Nigerian audience, the Nigerian population, will go and buy this deep, will buy these cassettes, you know. And there was a huge demand, and it just goes to show the fact that people want content or want films that that they, that relates to them, and they will pay for it, ir irrespective of how small or whatever they are willing to give to to buy these movies for themselves and it, it's it is what is happening right now in 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 the nollywood space where filmmakers are now taking that home video model into the internet where independent filmmakers are fighting to create and because we do not have enough cinema spaces or we don't have enough cinema screens in the country the internet now becomes another aspect or another viable um another viable way to show our films and earn a living and build an ecosystem for the Nollywood industry in Nigeria. And Petran, I hope you don't mind, just really quickly, I think it's also um, important, like I, I was alluding to this earlier on, there is a need to rethink the system where we, we it can't be one size fits all, especially in our specific environment. We have to curtail or rather shape um, the, the rollout to fit the space, to fit the people. Um, it's not America, it's not an established system, it's not even the French film system, you're not backed by government. It's, you have to make people's money back for them and so it's forcing people to rethink how they go about doing things so that there's respect for the, pro for the content, respect for the audience and respect for the investor itself. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you all. I, of course, I'm full of other questions I'd like to ask, but I'm, I'm really keenly aware that this is a participatory process. There are people in this, uh, on the floor who have a lot of uh, contributions to make or questions to ask. Uh, yes? Good afternoon. Benoit Genisi from FIAV, the International Federation of Film Producers Association. My question is for Alain Modo. Um, and it's a clarification. Uh, does this uh, project mean that when one vis-a-vis broadcaster 
will buy rights for one territory, uh, the content will be automatically available in the other territories. Uh, you may be aware that um, the matter is uh, discussed at the moment in Europe, and territoriality of rights is a pivotal instrument for independent producers to pre-finance, to finance, distribute, uh, market audiovisual content, and this is also a key incentive, I would say, to have independent producers' community to develop at national level, and obviously to be in a position to develop co-productions, and so on. Thank you. Um, before Alain answers, are there, uh, maybe we should take a couple more questions or points. Alain, I'm sure you know what to say, but uh, are there any immediate, like, then, yes, uh, from Waipo. Doesn't, does it work? Yes. This is Paolo Lanteri from WIPO. Well, it seems to, first of all, congratulations for this very rich uh, panel. We, I think we, we, we observed that there is a, a trend. I mean, and if we compare with what we listened yesterday, I would like to put forward a question to you, which is the following. It seemed to me that demand for local content is set to remain high not only in terms of the uh, movie sector, but as mentioned yesterday, definitely uh, news media, educational publishing, so that's not a, a challenge. We know that local content will still be required. We saw that we have uh, the lack of having a great amount of talented and passionate people that are engaged in creating local content with, and trying to find the means for doing that. So is that fair to say that the real problem is distribution or uh, in another way, how, if you were to highlight the main challenge in terms of local content, how would you describe it? Okay, well that's two fairly rich questions. Uh, we'll come back to all of you. Uh, if you agree, we'll just try and process those two. So Alain, you could probably answer both in different capacities, and of course, any of you here, and I'm thinking of you also, Gonzalo, on the issue of distribution, the question mark is this where, uh, where the, the system is, is challenged or stuck. Uh, thanks, Bertrand. Uh, DIFA, uh, which is my, my company, is working today for 135 African producers coming from 30 different countries. And when I'm selling the content they, they bring to us, I try to make, of course, the biggest number of sales on the larger number of territories for the diverse supports. And the idea that we uh, try to work with this uh, Africa hub is not to, to give uh, for the price of one territory the whole Africa uh, territories. And this is what we are fighting against, for instance, Canal Plus or Canal Overseas, even TV5, because these two, um, these two large uh, Pan-African broadcasters are paying less and less for more and more rights. For instance, it's in more interesting for, for, for us, for a producer, to sell a film to Air France or to any, any other um, uh, 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 air flight because they pay more for four months of right than Canal Plus for two years of right. So we take care of this uh, situation of independent producers and we, we want to help them to get the, mo the biggest number of partner broadcasters or funders for their content and all these broadcasters who are working with uh, uh, the African Union of Broadcasters are based on their local territories and they don't take international rights, they just take the right for their, uh, for their territory. So it's not an issue for us to give the right for, for free or for poor money for all kind of territories. And to answer your, your question, I think there are two major, uh, major issues for African content. The first one is financing and the second is distribution. Uh, coming back to what was said by my colleagues here, you know, there are countries where there are no theaters. In the case of uh, Republic, uh, the Republic du Congo, Brazzaville, zero theaters, and many others like Chad, there is no theaters. There are few uh, broadcasters able to pay for content. 
uh, video on demand is existing, of course, but it's only existing in big cities, whereas the uh, high speed internet is existing because in many other parts of the countries there, are no in there is no internet. So the big issue for content first is to be financed, and this is why we are thinking about trying to put this mechanism uh, on its feet in order to support financing. And the second is distribution. And a company like my, DIFA, is trying to put uh, for clients, uh, for, for producers, to bring all kinds of uh, clients around the table for the same content. And our best sale, for instance, have been one Nigerian film, which is a bit old now. It's what's called Last Flight to Abuja. And the second one is uh, Frontier, which is a, a film from uh, Burkina Faso. And we were able to sell these films in, uh, on different air flights, on different, uh, on different uh, channels, but nowhere, nowhere in theaters. And this is a problem of, of African content today. Thank you. I, I'd, I'd like to hear both of you on, on, this, on this topic of distribution, especially in the context what Alain and Paul has hinted at, which is the, the lack of perhaps what we would have called uh, a traditional distribution system, which starts in the theater. And, and continues in the video market and goes to broadcasting and so on. Um, and given the nature of this forum, how do you see the internet platforms uh, playing a role both in the financing and the future distribution of the things you'll be making in two, three, four, five years' time? Thank, thank you again. Um, it, it's interesting. Um, so if you look at theatrical release um, for pictures, I think on one end, people use that as a potential for which, or, or rather a, a stream, a, a financing stream. In Nigeria, a huge country, um, as far as population is concerned, under 50 cinemas, if I'm correct, um, a picture like Disney's um, Black Panther did uh, a little over $2 million in that, in that market. Um, and if you could you imagine if there were 100 cinemas. And so can you now, you have films that are fighting for real estate at this point. So an MS picture finds it hard to find a place to go because everybody else is fighting for that space. So it's, it's really, it's, it's a tight situation. And it, it's another space where people are rethinking what to do there. So people are rethinking, okay, you know what, maybe I might not be able to do multiplexes. Uh, maybe I can do one screen spaces that are in a high densely populated area that is built for cheaper. I might not have to pipe in ACs, it could be standing ACs, just finding ways to make this model um, a little cheaper and affordable. And I was having a conversation with you the other day where the conversation was now about um, the DCI projectors, um, how they're about n over nearly $200,000 for every screen that you're gonna be putting this in. How is a, f how is a exhibitor in, an, in a market where unit prices cannot match the $10, $20 that are paid in um, the West, how do you afford that kind of um, a projector in your space? So there's a lot of rethinking, and, and that's just for theater alone. Um, if you talk about streaming and digital, the internet is not necessarily proliferated across the country, so there are people who do not go on the internet at all. Um, I think there's some people whose highest internet connection is maybe WhatsApp videos that our grandmoms are now sending to us, by the way. Um, so um, it, it's, it, there's an expansion that has to happen, and when you talk about the next four to five years, it's going to be a mix of the regular cinemas, community cinemas, um, um, are the telcos able to sort of either zero rate or reduce drastically um, the cost of the internet uh, um, infrastructure or internet service to the to a, a, a base, and then the development of culture for people to go there to download uh, or to to um, even go to the cinemas. Because in my country, there's not yet a culture of cinema going. It is still something that people. It's still a luxury. Um, so there's a lot that has to be happening at the same time. I, I want to add to that. Um, you know, you know that this. I would use my film Casala as an example. Um, give or take six years before now, six seven years before now, if I had made Casala, um, I would not. I probably would have made the film and put it in my shelf, and not have been able to earn a living with the film. But right now, there's there's sort of hope. The internet has brought some sort of hope for filmmakers, especially from Nigeria. 
um, to, to make us see that in some ways we can still make a living out of our films. And with, with Kasala, I've, like I said, it's, it's been traveling. We've been to 24 international film festivals and how did this happen? People started hearing about the film through um, film freeway, through, through the internet. And there's a huge demand, there's a huge demand for African content and people have been making inquiries about it. And even though, yes, within the African com communities, we can't afford, afford, um, afford to, to watch films over the internet, but there's another large community who would pay premium, who would pay at least some good money to watch my films and help me raise money or to get money together for the next film. So it has given us some sort of hopes that at least you make a film and then you can earn a living and you can get enough money to make your next project. So it has brought some sort of hope to us as filmmakers, yes. Uh, Mr. Mazzoni, and then I think I'd quite like to hear you on the subject as well. <coughs> as one of the organizers of this um, discussion of today, um, I want to report on the sustainability and on the, your question about the platforms. The, um, the interaction I had with uh, one of the biggest YouTubers in African continent that I invited to this session and unfortunately he cannot come or he decided not to come. But I'm, he's one person that uh, has um, around one million contacts on YouTube uh, that is not negligible and um, has uh, and produce every month at least five, four or five uh, short videos of uh, five to eight minutes. Uh, and I asked him, could you, and was, uh, war, was uh, putting, I was putting in contact with them, with him by, uh, through the UNESCO office in Rabat, uh, because uh, he's considered as serious and um, one of the most followed. And I asked him on the phone when I invited him to come, uh, could you share with us uh, um, how do you live if, uh, through this uh, work that you do? Can you earn enough money, as Emma said, uh, for making your living? And uh, his answer was very simple. He said, no, not at all. Um, even if I have million of viewers on YouTube, this brings back to me only, in average, 200 uh, euros per month. In average, 200 euros per month for million of viewers. I asked how this is possible, and he said, because my share of the revenues that um, uh, is bring ma back to me from Google is based on the advertising on the local market of Morocco, that is the only one that they can quantify and, and they pretend that they can number, and this is my share. And I said, then why you do it? Because with 200 euro a month, you cannot produce four or five short uh, bits of five minutes well done, even if they are... Uh, than with the very light equipment. And he said, oh yes, the, mm, I use the, my image on YouTube and then I go to advertising agencies in Morocco that ask me to produce advertising movies or clips and then I get the money out of that. So there is no direct funding mechanism at the moment coming out from the platform. I'd like to uh, continue with that vein unless people want to, and I, I'm conscious that there may be other areas that have not been adequately covered yet. Bear with us. We, again, have a limited amount of time, but to perhaps not exhaust, but to um, find a, a closing point on, on this particular issue of sustainability and the distribution issue. Could you describe how you finance teenagers and what element of it is your risk and what element depends on pre-sales of the series to broadcast the situation in various countries in the African region, and what, what's the element of uncertainty and risk for you when you do that? Je crois qu'il faut que je reprécise l'élément fondamental de ma stratégie. So let me ask a question. Are, are people happy to pick up the running translation in English, or shall I speak? If there is a running translation uh, uh, in text, which I'm told is very good, are you happy to do this, or shall I shout along? Do I? No. Okay, je prendrai une formation en anglais pour être mieux compris la prochaine fois. Okay, donc euh, l'élément stratégique de ma 
stratégie aujourd'hui, c'est que j'ai une communauté de 120 000 adolescents dans l'espace francophone qui me suivent. Hang on, we don't have an English translation. So, il a donc une communauté... Uh, he has a community... <laughs> en espagnol, non uh, He has a community of 120 000 adolescent followers. I mean, followers to the program, not to him personally. Il faut bien qu'on comprenne que chaque adolescent a un potentiel de 5 à 10 autres qui rentreront dans cette communauté. So that's uh, for each... Uh, uh, Cinq, cinq. Pour oui, chacun, oui. c'est cinq amis qui vont rentrer dans cette si, communauté. So for one that, that uh, subscribes, that enters this, there's uh, another five friends that will join him or her. Alors, c'est important pour nous de, de développer cette communauté. Et so à partir de 2019, it's important to develop this community. Euh, nous allons introduire dans, des, nous allons développer des produits, ce qu'on peut appeler des produits dérivés. We're going to, uh, to uh, de, uh, develop uh, related products, to, uh, ancillary products uh, around the series. Alors, pour le faire, ce qui touche les jeunes, c'est la musique. So what, uh, what really gets the youth going is music. Mais euh, moi, j'aborde la musique sur la question du texte qui porte un message. Um, so I, uh, I go to the music sphere through the text strategy that I outlined earlier on, that, that carries a message. Alors j'ai approché la firme Sony Music dans sa base africaine, qui est d'Afrique francophone, qui est en Côte d'Ivoire. So I approached Sony Music, which has a, a HQ in, in Francophone Africa. Et nous sommes en train de travailler pour la production d'un album. And we're working on producing an album autour de la thématique « Teenager, l'univers des adolescents ». Et cet album sortira au mois de juin 2019, euh, juste après la sortie de la saison 4. Just after the, uh, the release of, uh, of uh, the broadcast premiere of season four of, of Teenagers. Alors cet album sera l'élément qu'ils partageront entre eux. This is the element, the album, the music album with the element that they, they will be able to share between themselves. Les textes sont écrits par des jeunes, nous avons reçu des textes sur notre plateforme. The texts are written by the young. Et la sélection, euh, les contenus textuels seront faits par des jeunes qui se retrouvent dans différentes régions d'Afrique. Les paroles, oui, les paroles. Sorry, the lyrics, therefore, are written by the young. Yeah? Donc, pour répondre à la question de Bertrand sur le modèle économique en Côte d'Ivoire, to answer my question on the economic model for this kind of adventures, la compagnie Orange Côte d'Ivoire, Orange Côte d'Ivoire, pour chaque saison, for each season, met à disposition à peu près 40% du budget. Uh, puts up 40% of the budget. Euh, ma société met sur la table 20% du budget. I self finance 20% of it through my own company. Et les 40% qui restent And the balance of 40%, viennent 40%. du fait que pour chaque saison, il y a à peu près 12 pays so there are 12 other countries qui diffusent cette série. That will broadcast my series. Et euh, l'avenir pour moi, c'est à travers ce que je développe en termes de communauté. L'avenir, ce que yeah, je développe en termes de communauté d'adolescents. Ce sont les produits dérivés issus de cette communauté. They are the, uh, they are the ancillary, uh, products of, of this qui financeront community. la suite du programme. That, that will help finance the, the follow through, the, the next iterations of this program. Nous avons quand même un objectif, hein, c'est d'essayer d'approcher des grandes firmes, des grandes sociétés qui s'intéressent aux jeunes de 6 à 25 ans. We want to approach uh, companies that are interested in the demographics of people from 6 to 26. Yes. Oui, parce mm -hmm. que c'est à peu près toutes les cibles qui nous... Je parle de 6 à 25 parce que nous allons créer une saison. Because sur ce qu'on appelle les teenagers, c'est-à-dire ce sont les 6 à 12 ans. Nous sommes en train de travailler sur une série pour les 6 à 12 ans. For, for between between 6 12. Et j'aurai donc la gamme de 6 à 25 ans. That way I'm going to have the full range of 6 to 26. Nous sommes convaincus que ça représente une valeur. We convinced that this represents value. Et qu'un modèle économique très fort peut être sorti de ce concept. And that a strong, sustainable economic model can emerge from this venture. Voilà, j'ai Sony, j'ai Orange, Orange, et j'attends, j'espère avoir d'autres marques qui sont des marques fortes. Et l'une des marques qui m'intéresse, mais je ne sais pas comment les contacter, uh, like, sure contact c'est la firme Disney. It's Disney. 
Je suis un enfant de Dieu, je ne sais pas si je ne savais pas qu'ils étaient dans la I'm salle, mais je pense qu'il y a quelque chose à faire avec une marque comme celle-là. Alors, quand Black Panther est sorti, quand Black Panther est sorti, c'est par moi que le président de Disney France est passé pour, uh, Disney, the went pour présenter Black Panther en Côte d'Ivoire. Uh, Donc j'ai dû mobiliser les producteurs, les journalistes so pour I venir à cette conférence de presse. To, to Et quand j'ai entendu ce qu'il a dit... Said, je me suis dit, continue à développer ta communauté, et puis un jour, vous ferez peut-être affaire. Ça sert à ça, le travail d'un producteur, c'est de développer quelque chose. Producer, et dans, dans mon cas, ça m'a pris 12 ans. Case, Mais l'idée, c'est à un moment, trouver une convergence avec des marques fortes. Et même marques. si je n'y arrivais pas, j'ai passé 12 ans fantastiques à développer I, I les adolescents jusqu'à ce qu'ils deviennent des adultes. Et rien que ça, je suis un homme heureux avant de rencontrer ces marques. And that makes me a happy man even I have my with those Mais j'insiste, je les attends. But I'm insisting, I'm, I'm expecting them. Well, thank you so Merci. Much. Thank you so much. And I'd like to, uh, I'm conscious of, of um, not monopolizing the panel time on, on, on this issue alone. I wanted to go back to you, Liana, because at the other end uh, of this spectrum of issues, we have education, and you're making an effort to develop a ca capacity there for a population, God bless Google, of 2.976 million. Uh, in Armenia, plus uh, substantial uh, diaspora, as those of us who live in the U.S. or, or U.K. know. Um, so what, how do you do, uh, what do you need in, uh, as resources uh, in order to develop, develop initiatives like the virtual college or rural libraries, digitization program, etc.? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for this opportunity to speak about that. Uh, as I said, we have recently the discussions about the online educational platforms in Armenian language. And uh, during the preparation of that session, the youth organizers um, made a research on this topic, collaborated with experts and represented some uh, educational resources available in local language. In fact, there are a lot of professional courses available online, and online education goes really viral everywhere. So why the youth representatives thought that this topic is important to discuss at the national IGF? Being a group of students, they always come uh, to an issue that they have different options of getting a lot of information online, in either in English or Russian. But if they search uh, for something in Armenian, either they get very poor data or don't get anything at all. So they have to read in other languages. That's why they met this session uh, with people uh, that are doing something uh, to this field development. The youth invited uh, speakers with relevant experiences to share their stories for the development of the area. Uh, and uh, briefly, I'll uh, inform you about that pro three projects and initiatives that I told you before and uh, which uh, have been done for local content development in Ar Armenia. Uh, so the American University of Armenia, in cooperation with the Armenian General Benevolent Union, launched a virtual university. It has well-designed courses. Uh, as you might know, as you said, Bertrand, uh, Armenia has a unique situation in terms that we have a very big uh, worldwide diaspora. In fact, there are around 3 million Armenians living in Armenia and more than 7 million living outside of the country. People of Armenian nationality spread over the world uh, and especially young generation usually don't speak Armenian language. And in order to improve the situation, the virtual university provides all these materials in seven languages, including Armenian, along with English, French, Russian, Spanish, and Turkish. The university gives opportunity first to study Armenian language and also to study the Armenian culture around 3,000 years of history, literature, even chess. The university has almost 3,000 students who are not only from Armenia, but from all around the world. 
So in fact, within 10 years, this project did quite a lot and went a long distance. This has been a very unique startup for the Armenian online educational sphere. Another very important project done in Armenia is the development of rural libraries with a grant uh, received by the Internet Society. Nearly six years ago, rural libraries had no internet access or even a computer in Armenia. For many students living and studying in regions, internet access uh, is a really big issue. So that is why at least the libraries of their institution should provide it for them. This must have been highlighted as an important issue which needed solutions. So um, there came a project, Computer Services and Wi-Fi Internet for Rural Libraries. It's been a six year already that ISOC Armenia has been implementing this project to support the rural libraries with computers, internet access, and appropriate software for those computers. Around 120, 130 computers were granted to libraries and provided for the maintenance. The problem is not just providing technology, but also to be able to help them in using it. On the other hand, as a continuation to the discussions about the libraries, we mentioned the importance of digitalizing educational sources, creating e-libraries, and making them open to everyone. Digitalization, of course, brings more issues with it, but it is becoming more and more important with the technological development. Despite the fact that most universities in Armenia have their online platforms, most of the study materials are not available online, which makes the platforms useless. So here comes the question of what resources to use, how to digitize materials, and how to keep the copyright issues. These issues are also being discussed and developed. And the third thing that I want to highlight, another relevant and big project, is being implemented by TUMO Center for Creative Technologies, which is one of the best non-formal educational centers in Yerevan. Uh, by the way, free of charge for everyone. TUMO now has around 40,000 students across Armenia, and it is enlarging its community by opening new centers in new cities and countries. And by the way, less, uh, very recently, uh, a center, Tumo Center, was opened in Paris as well. Uh, and it is already a very popular center. The educational formula in Tumo is 50% self-education and 50% via structured courses. This gives the advantage of raising the effectiveness uh, of the educational process. Right now, it has almost 100 courses around IT, making robots, creating games, and other computer programs. Uh, right now, Timo is working on a new software which will enable them make the educational materials open for everyone, accessible by the internet. They also apply innovative solutions to improve the technical aspects, particularly they move to cloud computing technologies for the achievement of their goals and the local educational content uh, development in English and Armenian, basically. Besides this, the major objective for TUMO is uh, empowering the youth to receive qualified education, especially the one they aren't able to receive at school. This is what we wanted to share with you about the existing and successful initiatives on local content in Armenia. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, thank you. Uh, Liana, the, the, the centers, uh, which is your third item, uh, the one you just spoke about, uh, are these for uh, higher education students, or is it any level? Does it reach no. out to the teenage, to the teen? If you section? mean the two more centers, this is not a higher education. This is for the school age years. So um, it is an alternative, uh, non-formal education after the classes. Uh, it's starting uh, from the age of 12, actually. And can some students be exclusively educated through the center, or do they have to combine this with normal school curriculum, for instance? Or? Right. Yes, we can do that. Right. Thank you. Well, I'm aware there's only a few minutes left. I suppose we could be rogue and go a little bit over, but um, I
sorry, if you choose to broaden the, the scope of what we've covered already, at least uh, as, a, uh, as a placeholder for the next uh, iteration of this open process, please, please do so now or for, forever hold your peace. <laughs> Um, yes, sorry, over there. If you could say who you are and, and then address your question. My name is Susan Anthony. I'm a proud card-carrying member of the Inter uh, International Documentary Association, which is based in Los Angeles. I'm just a wannabe. I am not like the, the, the very uh, lovely people who are on the panel. But uh, I, like to, I like to watch what's happening in the industry. And one of the questions that I have um, in my mind is about crowdfunding. I get quite a bit of solicitations from uh, Kickstarter and Indiegogo and uh, similar initiatives uh, for crowdfunding various projects. And because I've identified myself as a person who's very interested in creative content, I get a lot of overtures for crowdfunding for uh, a variety of films, sometimes documentary, sometimes uh, uh, fictional. So, I but I have no idea whether that's really working for the people in the film industry. And I'd be very interested in knowing whether this has been explored in Nigeria or in any other country that may be represented on the panel. Thank you so much. Uh, one final question, uh, if we have the time, and then get the panel to perhaps answer, if those who want to. And then perhaps also I'd like to ask the panel to say in a few words, perhaps what their, their, their wishes for what the regulatory environment of the internet could deliver to, to them to, to help deliver sustainability of local content. Um, any, more, any more question or point before we do that? Right, well, I can see there's uh, a bit of a fatigue setting. <laughs> um, perhaps then I will ask uh, each panel member, if you would, not just to address uh, Susan's uh, interesting question about crowdfunding, if you think you're, you're up to, for it, but also uh, segue into what, what very briefly into a, a, a one or two asks about what sort of regulatory um, uh, in initiative systems would enable you fur to, to further make your activity sustainable wherever you are. Alan, no, and you kick off and then pass on to Alain. Just to, to your question about crowdfunding, um, I like to say <laughs> I'm African. We've been crowdfunding before crowdfunding was ever a term. Um, we are constantly asking our uncles and our aunts and our friends and our loved ones, right? Um, but then also there is a, a perceived, uh, or there is a, a preconception about who we are as Nigerians, once again, living brands. Um, most in generally we have the 419 sort of fraud name attached to our, our nationality from, from examples from people who have done bad things, but not everyone is bad. So it's, it's, it's an interesting format to find. I know a filmmaker called Blitz the Ambassador who made a film called The Burial of Kojo in Ghana, and I saw it at a film festival in New York in, October, in September, and um, the last I heard, a, a, a lady, um, her name is, uh, she has a company called, uh, um, she made the film Selma, um, she's a director in The Wrinkle in Time, and she, she was courting them to distribute the picture. Um, and Ava DuVernay, that's her name, and she, she's, a big, she's a big talent in the US and interested in, in um, unheard voices, so the African f voice she's interested in distributing. So that one transaction has moved into something else. Um, but to your question specifically, crowdfunding does exist, but in a different model in my market, not necessarily on a computer somewhere with un unknown voice, un unknown faces. Um, oh, one more minute. Um, uh, as far as what I would like to see, I think it's more about the development of distribution, development of story to story development, um, development of um, the talent as we move to make this, these um, projects, these films, these stories. Uh, I'm not sure that uh, crowdfunding could be the solution for film industry uh, and especially in Africa. And I'm afraid that even in France, crowdfunding is decreasing and many of the platforms who are working on it are now in bankruptcy. Just to conclude, uh, 
Africa is a huge territory with many big differences between the English speaking, uh, Portuguese speaking, and French speaking territories. But there are huge Pan African institutions and banks who are quite strong and very healthy. And I'm sure that uh, these uh, Pan African, um, Pan -African uh, bodies, public or private, could be a lot for uh, the cultural industry and the film industry when they will be able to work together with, um, with uh, creators, uh, producers, and with different uh, member states. This is one of the lack uh, I saw on this uh, continent. Uh, member states are working in their, in their, on their side, but there is nothing, nothing about Pan-African policy. Thank you, Emma. Okay, I, I'm going to talk as, a, as an independent producer, and I will say that um, the, the film industry is sort of my life. It is something that I have decided to do, and it is very jealous. Once you decide that you want to become a filmmaker, you can't do, you practically can't do anything else because you're spending days months, years, producing and creating. So this is our life, my life, and we've managed to build an ecosystem around us. We've managed to hire, we've managed to create. And it, it would be very, very nice to have um, policies that protect our works. I mean, I want to constantly do this. I want to tell the African stories, but I can't do it if my work is released out there for free and I can't make money to survive or to, 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 to create. So I think that policies should sort of be put in place to protect our works and to help us filmmakers distribute and to be able to make a living out of, out of what we do. Tout ce que je peux dire, c'est qu'il y a quelque chose que je voudrais rajouter parce que ça ne fait pas partie de nos débats. Tout ce, oh, que nous, uh, tout ce que nous développons depuis 12 ans avec ces jeunes, euh, surtout dans l'accord la, signé avec Sony, euh, il y a la question des droits d'auteur. Tout ce que je développe dans cet album... Euh, sortira avec la reconnaissance de tous ces jeunes qui ont écrit des textes, qui sont des messages et qui se retrouveront dans cet album. The, the de la propriété intellectuelle, bien sûr. C'est important parce que c'est une reconnaissance du fait que même jeunes, ils sont capables d'envoyer des messages qui pourront changer les comportements. Alors, sur mon environnement qui m'aide, ce sont tout simplement les structures qui se rendent compte que... What, what help do I get to do what I do It's, euh, The structures that are there to Dès l'instant où un groupe comme ça se développe de plus en plus, je pense que dans l'avenir, j'aurai un peu plus de contributions parce que n'ayant pas cru au départ, ils se sont rendus compte que cette communauté-là, elle, elle grandira de plus en plus. Voilà. Merci. Um, uh, Roberto, would you like to? Yeah, well, just just one sentence. Um, I, I, I think that uh, um, I'm looking forward to the moment in which uh, universal uh, acceptance will be fully, fully deployed mm -hmm. and that we will be able to uh, remove those uh, obstacles uh, to the development of uh, local platforms and therefore local content. Uh, Gonzalo. In response to Susan's question and mm -hmm. adding to what Emma said, and mm -hmm. in response also to one of your questions earlier, yeah. I, one, I don't think that crowdfunding is a, is a viable source of, or a very used source of uh, acquiring resources for making film in Colombia, which is my country. Um, what we have established in Colombia is uh, public policy under which you can access um, public resources for the production of film in any of its stages. And they're quite hefty in, in some cases. It's not just any money, it's a lot of money. Uh, so there is that. Um, in, 
response to your question as to what I, what I would change about that public policy in order to further uh, give more incentives to producers, I would definitely, um, I think that what Emma just said recently, the problem is not sometimes the time and money that you invest in making your film, but the inability to make returns mm -hmm. from that movie. And that has to do a lot of distribution, which Paolo uh, touched recently in one of his questions. Uh, so I would definitely change our public policy in the sense that we should give more resources to distribution, not only in traditional platforms, but online. And that, of course, brings a problem of abridging the digital breach that affects most of us, most of our uh, developing countries. Thank you, Ucha. Would you like, no, you're okay. Liana, sure. Okay, well, I'm going to hand over to Vim, and before that, thank all our panelists uh, from the bottom of my heart for their very passionate contribution uh, and fully factually helpful in the context of a, a gathering of, of evidence of best practice, which, again, this is a fluid process. We hope to have added uh, some useful material to, to this today. I remind you that uh, Emma's film will be screening tonight uh, at the restaurant on the seventh floor. Uh, if you'd like to join us for that, please uh, come to us after the panel, and it's essential that you RSVP because we have limited space. It'll be preceded by a, a cocktail dinner. So for those of you with appetite for more discussion about local content, this is the place to be tonight. Thank you. And I'll hand over to Vim for final words. Thank you. Very, very brief because the uh, next uh, group is already waiting outside the... Uh, as I said, the, this BPF will produce a final document. We will do our best to reflect as much as possible also the experiences that were shared on the panel. Uh, so the only thing that rests me is to thank the panelists for this, uh, well, different, uh, very different views and uh, ideas and experiences. And of course, thank you very much to Bertrand who has been uh, well, pushing this panel and basically carrying the heavy load of the work today. So thank you very much.
Okay.